Hi everyone and welcome to episode 501 of No Such Thing As A Fish. Well, what do we have for you this week? We have finished our summer live shows and we have loads of extra bits that I couldn't fit into the normal 50 minute to an hour episode of Fish. Usually what we would do with those is we'd make them into a compilation and they would go for our Club Fish members. Uh, that's where all the compilations go these days. But seeing as they were the live shows uh, that were coming to the end of summer and that were all sleeping off our hangovers from episode 500, we thought we would put this up on our main feed. Now, the thing is about these episodes is if you like the facts on fish, then these are some of the best episodes for you because they are super concentrated of little nuggets of information uh, but there's loads of fun silly stuff in there as well I really hope you enjoy it if you like your compilations then you can become a member of Clubfish you will also get ad free episodes you'll get other bonus content such as drop us a line where we go through the mailbox and meet the elves where we meet some of our newer members of staff at QI there's all sorts of stuff on there it's well worth joining and you can join there by going to nosuchthingsofish.com forward slash apple or nosuchthingsofish.com forward slash Patreon. Anyway, I really hope you enjoy this week's show. We'll be back next week with a normal episode, but for now, it's on with the podcast. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage our buddy Lou Sanders, everybody! Please welcome to the stage Rachel Paris, everybody! <laughs> Sophie Duker, everyone! Yeah. Hannah Fry! <laughs> we are joined by nerd royalty. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage Susie Dent! <laughs> he is, of course, no. Greg Jenner! Ariad Lloyd, everybody! It's Jamie Morton, everybody! <laughs> Sally Phillips! <laughs> Ella Alshamahi, everyone! <laughs> it is Richard Osman! Have you heard, there's, there's a great anecdote, which I've been trying to prove, but it's, um, I don't think it's true. I was, uh, um, actually, it's not true and it's not relevant. Let's move on. Um, <laughs> wow, we got amazing. to the end of that a lot quicker than normal, didn't we? <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Usually I waste all our time, but I'm learning. Nine that's years one of, in. That's it was one bullshit. Of, that's <laughs> one of your best stories, Dan. That's Thank one of you. the best stories you've ever told on stage. Um, quickly tell you guys about Alain Bombard. Oh, oh yeah, go on. Yeah, Alain Bombard go, was a French go. doctor and he is very unusual because he's one of the only people in history ever to shipwreck himself, okay? So this is amazing. Um, there were lots of people at the time being, you know, lots of shipwrecked sailors who, who were dying each year, like when, the, when their boats were shipwrecked. And he wanted to prove that even if you had no food or water, there were, there were ways you could survive. So he set off from the Canaries um, with a sextant, a tarpaulin, a fishing rod, and a sealed box of food and water, which he was going to try really hard not to open. <laughs> the self-control he must yeah, have had. Wow. He suffered terribly. <laughs> Like, mm, that's, so, his, that's his fault. Yeah, he, he had no rain for three weeks, uh, and then storms snapped the mast of his dinghy. Uh, right. Swordfish approached his rubber dinghy, nose first. Oh, terrifying. I know, I know. Oh, my God. I know. That's uh, cool. 53 yeah. days later, he bumped into a ship, and they said, oh, yeah, you're still 600 miles off course for where you're going. Right. He had just become a father as well when he did this, which I find, <laughs> like... Well, at least he got some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> The length some people will go to. So, <laughs> anyway. That's amazing. But anyway, so he, he then he got on board this ship, which picked him up after 53 days. He had a small lunch of a fried egg, then got back on his dinghy and kept sailing towards Barbados. Right. And he made it there oh. in the end. He did it really? eventually. But yeah, I just think what a, what a self-experimenter to do that to yourself. Yeah. It's extraordinary. But what? why? <laughs> well, to prove that... Apart from not to see your child and wife <laughs> or partner... <laughs> I think to Did prove... it take him 18 years to get there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it was to prove what you could survive on, if you could survive on fish or, or plankton, which you, you can do. You know. And you yeah. can do that without actually doing it. You could just say, oh, I might eat fish today. <laughs> 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 There's my self-control right there. You need a tin of food that you can't open. <laughs> just out of curiosity, have we... 
have we been eating and drinking from the wrong end this whole time? <laughs> would there be would there be certain <laughs> things? <laughs> Well, because President Garfield was fed yep. through his oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. famously. Well, you've got, a, you've got a bit of your pint left, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> what better time to put it into practice? <laughs> a tutorial, if you will. Yeah. Uh, I think if you have the option, the yeah. mouth is a better option. If are we, we have we no other option, then okay. the rectum is acceptable. It's just fluids, though. So, I mean, if you're trying to absorb yeah. lots of nutrients, okay, then, you, then you know, your stomach and your upper digestive system will do all that work. So, so mm. it is a plan B, very much so. Okay. Um, I'll still you, try it. Have you, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was looking at people who, uh, who died laughing. Uh, this happened in 1920, and it was reported by an Australian newspaper called The Mudgy Guardian and Northwestern Representative. Okay. Do you know it? Yeah, yeah, that's my local. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's about a man called Arthur Cobcroft. Oh, and yeah. I'm, re I'm reading directly... Um, so, Mr. Arthur Cobcroft died at his home in Loftus Street uh, Saturday. Uh, he was reading... A, this 1920. He was reading an old newspaper of a 1915 date and was comparing the prices of various commodities with those of today <laughs> when he suddenly burst into laughter at the great <laughs> difference. He appeared to be unable to control himself and eventually collapsed and died. <laughs> Commodity prices. <laughs> They must have been so different. It's, <laughs> I'm laughing thinking about it now. It's amazing, because I reckon the cost of living crisis isn't that funny today. No. But for him. But if I say to you, oh, like, a Freddo used to be 10p. <laughs> yeah, you see, you've laughed. Yeah. yeah. Careful. Yeah. <laughs> I was anyway. reading about when something goes wrong on stage, and so that got me into a whole territory of if someone is hurt as they're acting, mm. what do you do? And I found this thing that apparently it's a huge problem for paramedics when they're called to help someone who's really injured, who's in a zombie movie, because they arrive, they have no idea who the patient is because everyone is bleeding, oh, everyone's yeah. got giant yeah. scars. Yeah. And even if they find the person who's really injured themselves, they just can't tell where the wound is yeah. at all because of the amount of prosthetics. Well, I broke a rib being chased by a zombie once. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I was in London, like one of these things where you pay to be chased by zombies. <laughs> yeah, you We've all, all know got our kinks. Things. That's uh, <laughs> sounds. It does sound a bit like uh, a. You and know. I was like watching a lot of American football at the time, and the zombie was coming towards me, and I thought I'd do some amazing dodges past him, and I got nowhere near past him, <laughs> and he kind of tagged me and pushed me into a wall, and I broke a rib. And oh they, we had to go to, like, the A&E, and there were quite a lot of people who had had similar problems. And it was just oh. like you say, it was like being in MASH. You know? It's yeah. like, <laughs> just people with arms hanging off. You didn't know what was real and what wasn't. Yeah. I found out that Bungay in East Anglia has the highest number of Satanists in the UK. Oh, oh do they? Now, no, I'd like they? to take issue with that. Would you? Because I think it's Bolsover in Derbyshire. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. How many has Bolsover got? 17, 17 in 2011. 17. 17. 17 in Bungay. Ooh. Oh. Okay, but it might be relative to population. I don't know how big Bungay is. Sounds tiny. It does sound <laughs> tiny. But wait, the bowls, this bowls over thing is from the census in 2011. Where this more was people... from the census. I bet it's... Is it a later census, mine? Maybe? I don't know. We've had, is had there another one since. 2021, yeah. 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 But the, in Bolsover, it was only 17 people who wrote Satanist as their religion. But that yeah. was the highest per person... Like uh -huh. highest, the highest concentration. Even yeah. Bristol only had 34 people who wrote Satanist, ah. but Bristol's huge. So, so the <laughs> Google article I saw said um, Bungay in East Anglia, hmm. and then the next one was Bronsbury wow, here so in London, which had 20. So there's a big okay. B Bronsbury, contingent of the Bolsover. alphabet. <laughs> Beelzebub. <laughs> ah, the beast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was a there was a footnote that said they thought Bungay might <laughs> might have been doing it as a kind of tourist attracting thing. Because they've got a big black dog. I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> like a myth in, of a big black a satanic dog in apparently Bungay. came in. Yeah. And well, they're trying to push that. It's worked. Ah. I mean <laughs> we're all talking about Bungay all the time. We are. <laughs> oh did you know yeah. there's a pantomime horse arrest in Tesco's? <laughs> oh <laughs> no. really? When it, was, um, when it was found that the Tesco's budget brand Everyday Value Burgers contained 29% horse meat. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, pantomime horse went to protest in Tesco's. <laughs> <laughs> crying, going, Mommy, Daddy. And it was led away yeah, into the staff the department police, and yeah. it was never seen again. <laughs> Here's a good quick little tip. If you meet someone who's Dutch and they say to you, 
I fuck horses. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> Not necessarily. You mean. Top tip. Oh, I can't confirm for certain. Yeah. What's but, the, um, so is that Dutch? Does it sound F-O-K like? FOK means else? breeding. Yeah, they breed horses. Yeah. Oh. And there supposedly was a story where the Dutch foreign minister was introduced to JFK, and he said, "Hi, uh, how are you?" He said, "I'm very good. Well, what are your hobbies?" I fuck horses. And no. he said, so why did he me? only say that one word in Dutch and the rest of it in English? That's where I. Uh, <laughs> that's where I also questioned the anecdote. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it does stand. I looked up the translation, yeah. and FOK is for breeding. So. Yeah. Again, you'd never hear that in that kind... Unless horses. I didn't look up horses. I didn't look up if they say that in Dutch. Um, Should we move on? Um, (laughs) So one person who did slightly pioneer the idea of living underwater was Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau, you all probably know him. Uh, he's, he's, he had the Calypso, and he was one of the greatest <laughs> ocean... Sorry, I, the, I, I, I don't know. What? You know the dance? No. I, <laughs> you know the, confu- the ice cream? I was confusing it with the Calypso. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, he's one of the greatest <laughs> oceanographers of all time. He, and he kind of pioneered documentary making in the yeah. field of immersive, and you follow okay. a team, and... Uh, the Life Aquatic by Wes Anderson is very much based on the story of Jacques Cousteau. But on a scientific level, he also invented or co-invented the aqualung, which is why we're able to go diving. So that was Jacques Cousteau. And then one of the other things he did was this thing called the con shells, which are the continental shelves, which were habitable zones down in the ocean. And continental shelf two was this big looking starfish kind of housing unit. And um, he lived in it with his crew for a number of days. They had a parrot that came down and lived with them as Fun. well. Yep. Because that, in a sort of slightly dark sense, it was like the canary in the mountain, you know, it was, something was oh. wrong with the levels of oxygen. Okay. The parrot would know first, and so they could get out of there. So he set a record <laughs> for the longest that anyone's been down there. Yeah. And then his son, Fabian Cousteau, oh, so, Fabian no, he's the grandson. the grandson. So he lived down there and held the record for the longest anyone's been under the ocean for quite a while. And then it got taken over by uh, a professor and a student. Um, but he invented a shark submarine. Have you seen this? This is, this is incredible. It's the submarine in yeah. the shape of a shark. So the idea is that he can observe sharks while being one of them. It's a one-person oh, submersible. No. He has to be in a diving suit while he's in it because water flows all the way through. He has to drive the submarine while laying down in the shark. Oh, and his elbows are steering it as he goes. Why his elbows? What's he doing with his Sorry, hands? Sorry, he's on his elbow, steering with his hands. Okay, thank you. Like, it feels a needless layer of complication for an otherwise <laughs> flawless idea. He's on his phone, isn't he? And he's just like... Um, I was looking at, uh, in British elections, you know, there's that thing of always on election night, a general election night, there's a kind of who gets their, their ballot counted first, and it's which constituencies or cities Oh, it's do usually it. like Sunderland versus Newcastle? Sunderland and Newcastle. And oh, you Sund- mean like a race to get yeah. to the final result? I was reading about Sunderland's methods for ensuring they stay at the top of their game. Yeah. And they're amazing. So Are they? they- is well, that what we're going with it's kind of a tradition now, and they've like they've done it. They've really gone into detail. So they hire bank tellers because they're very good at flipping through lots and lots of paper very quickly, mm. like individual bits of paper. They use lighter paper for their ballot sheets because it's slightly easier to count fast. <laughs> so they switch from 100 GSM to 80 GSM. For wow. Their, yeah. Um, they do obviously they do practices like they pra- they do dress rehearsals with the students who are running holding the ballot boxes. And they, uh, like, they say you're going to be filmed. You're going to be. You need to be. You know, careful. You don't want to drop those. That'll be a disaster. And, um, and they... Labour always wins in that constituency, right? <laughs> I think they do. I think they always win. I guess they would. They yeah. Do, yeah. But because you, I suggesting... remember, like, I always watch the election night and the, all the results come in, and I only stay up for Sunderland and Newcastle, hundred okay. percent Labour, and then I go to bed. <laughs> Uh, I'm always slightly disappointed when I wake up. <laughs> I'm kidding, yeah. <laughs> you can get woolen coffins these days, I believe. Yeah, this is very, this yeah, is very eco exciting. coffins. A little prize for anyone who can guess the headline that was used on the story announcing us in 2011. Oh, uh, Take your time. That you're allowed yeah. woolen coffins now. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool woolen coffin that's been launched. <laughs> Gonna have to hurry you. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. Really? No. Let's, all, no, let's all believe. Silent bits of podcasts are very popular. Anyone in the audience? <laughs> this is too tough a quiz, Andy. Anyone? What cozy bur- burial. Cozy burial's good. Uh, Famous phrase, cozy burial. They went with <laughs> rest in fleece. Oh. Uh, yes. Not bad. Not mine. Very nice. But lovely. Um, yep. Yeah. Very and you can, be, you can be buried in it or it can be cremated. It's, it's the same either way. It's, you can get yeah. cardboard coffins, wool coffins, willow coffins, banana leaf coffins, Ooh. or you can now be wrapped in a shroud as we used to be. And there's a big movement, a natural burial movement which is um, because there are so many 
horrible chemicals in a lot of funeral processes, especially if you are embalmed. It's very bad for the environment, for your body to go into the ground full of chemicals. Right. So if you have a biodegradable coffin, then you can be buried in, like, what, in a natural burial, basically a field that someone's mm. agreed to have people buried in. Can you get um, wicker? Yeah, wicker, yeah. And you can okay. also get one that's made of like a mushroom fungus that will start to decompose your body faster. Oh, yes. right. Which I think is amazing. That is cool. And, so, and this is really important. I've talked about this before. I'm big talk of planning your funeral and advanced care planning. It's a big thing that you should write this down now. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to get wrapped in that wool suit. Right. <laughs> All I just hot. like to put it, because this is being recorded and will go out, I do not want to be eaten by mushrooms when okay. I go. Okay. <laughs> do you want banana leaves or wicker or wool? Uh, I'll be put in a big wicker cage and yeah. burned by some... <laughs> <laughs> and, and probably some people will be dancing around in white in the yeah, situation. That's going to be an amazing podcast when it comes yeah, out yeah. there. <laughs> One of the suffragettes, this was Anne Hunt. She walked into the National Portrait Gallery and she stopped in front of a portrait of Thomas Carlyle, who's one of the founders, uh, painted by Millet, and she slashed it. It was a really famous thing that she did. Uh, there was only one member of staff who was suspicious. Uh, it was a guy called David Wilson. And the first time she walked in, he wasn't that suspicious. He thought she was American. Um, <laughs> <laughs> apparently, he, he thought she was American because she was looking so closely at the pictures. <laughs> apparently, that's what Americans do. But then the second day, she came back in again. Uh, and David Wilson said that he, she couldn't be American because no American would have paid the six pence entrance fee twice over. <laughs> wow. So it was like, that must be someone so, up to no good. Was she coming back? Had she already slashed something? No, the, the first, first day? time she went in was to kind of case the joint. Out, yeah. yeah. So there were lots of sort of famous incidents, like particular flashpoints, where, for example, uh, Mrs. Pankhurst was going to speak at an event and then, the, and it, you know, the police didn't want it to happen. And so that became a. a Celebrity. So there was an event called the Battle of Glasgow. Oh, so you've yes, read about this. Yes. So Mrs. Pankhurst was going to Glasgow to speak, and the police did not want her to appear. They didn't want her to speak. Um, there were 50 police constables in the basement of the building where she was billed to appear. All the tickets had been sold. You know, huge presence, like people checking everyone on the door. Suddenly, Mrs. Pankhurst appears on stage out of nowhere, and it turns out she just come in as a punter with a ticket, <gasps> oh. sat by the platform, right. and then gets up and starts speaking. Psych. So all the police start coming up from the basement because they're, you know, they're activated. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, <laughs> 20, 25 of the suffragette bodyguards get their clubs out and start trying to beat the police up. Yeah. You know, so you've got 25 suffragettes with clubs, 50 policemen with their truncheons. One of the suffragettes shot a policeman in the chest point blank with a blank bullet, so it, wasn't, it was just a kind of surprise rather than a... <laughs> um, <laughs> She said that. Surprise! Oh, yeah. so sorry. I'm so um, sorry. Are you okay? That no, was my fault. And then plainclothes detectives tried to get onto the platform where Mrs. Pankhurst is still speaking at this point. Yeah. She's still delivering her speech. The plainclothes detectives are trying to climb onto the platform. It turns out the floral garlands all the way around the platform are barbed wire. They've been disguised. Wow. I know. It's, there, there are old ladies now beating the police with their umbrellas as they're trying to fight the trunch. We're like, it just sounds like an insane scene. Who's listening to the speech at this point? <laughs> weird moment today. I was researching crisps and I found out in Japan at the moment there's a trend that's going on and then it turns out this is going global now to eat crisps using chopsticks so that you don't get the oil on your fingers as you are doing the other work that you're doing, right? If you're right. eating... So, so I was literally okay. eating a bag of crisps as I was researching that fact and my fingers absolutely were sticky on the, on the, uh, the Mac uh, sort of mouse bits. You Keyboard. know, like... Keep, oh, the keypad, yeah, yeah. The yeah, keypad, yeah. no, the, like the, you know, the hand mouse thing. That the you, keypad, yeah, yeah. The, well, the keypad's the, the, the mouse. letters and the... Do you mean the mouse? The tracker, the, the trackpad. The trackpad? Gosh, it's like living in the future, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I found myself reading a piece about historical novels by a writer called James Forrester. And I just want to quote from this is an article he wrote about 10 years ago. He, and listen to this. He was because he, he reads a lot and he I think he wrote historical novels too. One highly acclaimed and commercially successful recent historical novel had on page three the statement that there were no priests within a three-day ride. Taking into consideration the time of year and the location of this statement, I calculated that there were between five and eight thousand priests <laughs> wow. within a three-day ride in that year. I could not carry on reading. <laughs> <laughs> children are quite weirdly good at lying mm. so or yeah. rather they're good at the, uh, 
So adults are very bad at telling when children are lying. This is the thing. Ah. And the reason for that, they can only work it out about the same as guessing on like 54% of the time. So not much better than chance, really. Yeah. And the reason for that, there are lots of experiments, and it's because adults assume that children lie like adults do. And they assume that children's faces are, like, move in the same ways that adults do. But basically, there have been a load of experiments which assumed that children are not proficient liars. And in fact, the problem is that children just look guilty quite a lot of the time. <laughs> Like, because you, know, you talk to a young child, they might avert their eyes, they might fidget, they might be incoherent. They mm. look, they look like they look like they're hiding something, <laughs> and that's so adults think they're lying when they, they may well not be. So yeah, I think I look permanently guilty. It makes me a bad liar, but it also right. makes me a really bad truth teller. That's the okay. problem because I look like I'm lying. Whatever. So any lie I tell, I'm going to get caught out because I look like I'm lying. And any time I tell the truth, no one believes me because I look like I'm lying. <laughs> it's very difficult. That's why I have to have the computer in front of me on pointless. <laughs> One of the reasons that we have X as the X-Men and the um, X-Ray and stuff like that is because Descartes um, used X to mean an unknown in algebra, yeah. wasn't it? He decided to use X, Y, and Z. And the story goes that the reason he did it is because the printer who was doing his book said, I got loads of X's, Y's, and Z's left over because no words have X's <laughs> in them, so I might as well use them. But it turns out that because he's French, actually X is quite a common, relatively common in French, and it might have been because they just had lots of X's because X is quite common. Ah. But yeah, but without those, without Descartes, we might not have the X-Men, we might have the A-Men or the, or the B-Men or whatever. Oh, wow. And we wouldn't have... The C-Men. Tweets. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was looking into things that are named after people, and I was, thinking, I was reasoning that there must be something which is the most famous thing that people don't know is named after a person. Okay, oh, yeah. that's so, okay. So sh we, we've said before, like, shrapnel is named after a bloke who was called General Henry Shrapnel yeah. or something. Yeah. I think yeah. you said that nachos were named after a guy called Ignacio. Ignacio. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, so, I, so we've done a few of these before, and I... Yeah. The Cardigan, do people know it was named after the seventh Earl of Cardigan? Okay, that is known. Because I read an article claiming that he was wearing one while he led the charge of the Light Brigade <laughs> during the Crimea War. I thought that can't, that can't be right. There would have been a uniform. Because it feels too... Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, like pushing his march during war. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it is named after him, but yeah, I think... And it was during the Battle of Balaclava. That's the thing that people yes. don't... No. Yeah. And the cravats go back to Croats, because yes. Croats wore those. Yeah. And um, slaves were Slavs. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not quite eponyms, it's the kind of toponyms. But, and, and I'm really sorry to always lower the tone, but um, <laughs> did you know that bugger is actually a riff on Bulgarian, because there were these Bulgarian sects in the 11th, sects in the 11th century <laughs> that were supposed to get up to strange sects. So that's where bugger comes wow. from. Wow. Oh. Yeah, that's kind of toponym, though, isn't it? It's really not an eponym. I think. <laughs> Strictly speaking. Sean. Um, in 1996, the Swedish Navy admitted that they had found a huge amount of evidence of Russian submarines operating in their waters, right? Really serious, you know, post-Cold War, threatening security environment. Um, and there had been 6,000 incidents, a huge number reported from 1981 to 1994. It turns out that what they had been hearing was largely otters splashing. Play playful otters splashing in the water. Wow. There were about one in a thousand claims were li was likely to be a submarine, and the rest was just <laughs> random. Assault. They also um, they found out that it was farting fish as well, didn't they? Yeah, herring. Oh, yeah. Herring. Farting, herring. Herring yeah. Yeah. farting fish. Yeah. Farting, yeah, they communicate by farting. In fact, we have this fact or QI, which is herring communicate by farting. Yes. And we tweet it about once a year, just so that everyone tweets Richard Herring to go, <laughs> oh, I didn't know you communicated by farting. <laughs> He hates us. <laughs> I can imagine. So the thing I want to mention about protests is to do with another quiz show, which is Mastermind. And oh, yeah. the first question ever was about protests. And it was about a painting by Picasso, which was a protest about the bombing by Spanish planes on a village. And the question was, what year, when the event took place, was the inspiration for the painting? The answer was 1937. <laughs> the answer was 1937. But and the question was about German planes, not Spain. So the first ever question on Mastermind was incorrect. Oh. Yeah. So how shit is Mastermind? <laughs> I, just th I just feel like it's QI and Countdown on stage together. Let's shit on someone. <laughs> what do you reckon, Susie? There's shit, yeah? yeah? Let's get some headlines. That's it. Yes. Wait. 
<laughs> oh, I don't want to diss any other oh, shit. Oh, yeah, that was vicious. Can... Um... <laughs> Just on religion while we're there, yeah. um, there's been a few naked religions in the past. So the Adamites, uh, they were a sect in North Africa in the 2nd, 3rd and 4th centuries uh, that used always wore no clothes during the religious ceremonies. The idea being that they were going back to the Garden of Eden before we had clothes and this was the best way to get close to God. Now, it became big again in the Czech Republic, in Czechia in 14th century, and people who were Adamites then would go naked through the towns and villages. So they would, everyone take their clothes off and they would go through the town saying, come and join our gang, you know, we're the, we're the closest like to Jesus. Conga, basically. You're describing <laughs> a naked conga. Sure, let's yeah. call it a naked... Well, they did do a lot of naked dances. They would have a fire and they would do naked dances around it, and the idea was that they rejected a lot of the things in the Catholic Church, and a lot of people think that they were like the precursors to the Protestant Revolution. So it was like, you know, these were the first people really to kind of go against the church, and then it oh. kind of built up and built up in Central Europe. God, um, but Oliver, it carried Oliver, up... Oliver Cromwell trimmed a lot of that stuff away, didn't he? <laughs> Before he came up with Puritanism. Yeah, sorry, yeah. go on. And then it carried on. And in the early US, they had some Adamites there. And I was reading about one clergyman who was writing about them. And he said... Um, about these people who were in church and were naked the whole time, if the planet of Venus reigned in their lower parts, making them swell for pride, or rather for lust, then the clerk with his long stick shall strike down the presumptuous flesh. So basically, if you... Yeah, yep. you would... Yeah. <laughs> and he said that on one occasion, there was a woman who made a congregation member rise in such an unmeasurable manner that the old clerk was forced to use both hands <laughs> to allay his courage, <laughs> at which the prophesizer was in such pain that the whole house could not hold him, and he said he would kill the clerk. And basically, this guy just started whacking his genitals with his stick. He attacked that guy, and... Basically, they only just stopped him from killing the clerk. Uh, but this guy said he wasn't bothered because it was in church. God would look after him, and it didn't matter if he killed the clerk. Because it was naked, it would all be fine. Ah. I f it feels like, we, feels like pants is just easier, isn't it? <laughs> just <laughs> a pair of pants. <laughs> so burrowing owls, they have lots of piles of poo outside their nest. And it's cow dung and bison dung and all of this. And then they just stand by the poo and wait. They just go into kind of sentry position and just stand there looking very still. And what scientists reckon is that they're fishing for dung beetles. Oh, wow. they've got freshish dung. Yeah. And dung beetles are really interested, and in burrowing owls love eating the, the dung beetles. Yeah. And so they'll just stand and wait and let the dung beetles approach. Isn't that crazy? They're, basically, crazy. they're basically fishing. Like it's... they're land fishing. Yeah. 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 No, I yeah. got it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to find a uh, if there was another naughty Barbie, you know, kind of like the, the origins of Barbie being yeah. a cool girl. Okay. And I managed to find one, which was the pole dancing Barbie. This was a one-off because it was part of a thing in Japan called Hebocon, which was, you know, like Robot Wars. This was anti-Robot Wars. This was a Robot Wars where robot, everyone robot specifically... Robot peace negotiations. No, no. Yeah. You, you had robot to Summit! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> robot Model UN! <laughs> you had to bring a, a very bad robot, basically. Okay. It had to be terrible. And so the worse it was, the better you got in the competition. Okay. You were, so there were 31 entrants, and a Barbie doll that was entered was a attacking through pole dancing Barbie. But the other ones that it went up How against... How did she attack you with the pole dance? I, I, so did she I, spin round and kick you in the I head? I think so, because I couldn't find any photos because this was mm. in 2013 and I think... Um, I before the invention of then. the camera. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. no, so, I, but it's, you know, it was a small thing yeah, that happened yeah, in yeah. Japan. The winner was a robot that was so sturdy that no one could knock it over, so it just stood. So the other things walked into it. Okay, that's and, uh, clever. And the best one was that uh, the person who got a special acknowledgement was one person, a lady, who accidentally left her robot on the train and then just went for a beer instead. And they were like, that level of shitness is so great. <laughs> we want to commend you with a special honor there. That's awesome. But yeah, pole dancing Barbie, the only one time in a anti-robot war Japanese competition, Hebicon. Very cool. Yeah. There is a thing called the Bubble Baba Challenge. Uh, this is at the Vuoksky River in Russia, so it's near St. Petersburg. Uh, and it's a race, a fl uh, kind of a rafting race, but instead of a raft, you have a sex doll. Uh, it began in 2003. Uh, anyone's allowed to enter, but you have to have a compulsory alcohol test before you start. Oh, yeah, we don't want to... 
We don't want to make this seem tawdry or unprofessional. <laughs> Uh, and in 2006, there was... That guy riding the sex doll down the river's had a shandy! Get him! <laughs> the most exciting of the Bubble Baba Challenge uh, sex doll races was in 2006. So all the racers jumped into the water and there was a really, really strong wind and that meant that almost all the sex dolls blew away. And oh, so you've just got all these Russian, mostly guys, in the water just sort of without their sex dolls. And there was only one person, a guy called Osipov, who reached the finish line. But he was disqualified uh, because the jury had noticed signs of recent sexual activity on the doll. <gasps> oh! <laughs> Which was very much banned. I've got another, bar we've got another Barbie thing. Okay. Yeah, Barbie has uh, officially uh, not part of any political party, right? So there's a various reasons for that. She's been a presidential candidate every election since 1992. Uh, <laughs> much like Hillary Clinton. Hey! <laughs> um, not fair. Um, but she got, in a, she got in a beef with Donald J. Trump. Bar Barbie and Donald J. Trump had a, had a beef at the last election. Okay. Um, because Donald J. Trump tweeted, there's a thing called Voter Barbie, and why it's do you to encourage... Why do you keep saying J in his name? Oh, uh, sorry, that's his junior I'm talking about. Ah. Donald Trump Jr. Okay, cool. I believe. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Could be the senior. I mean, they're both such... They're both such different Twats. characters. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, know who, I don't know which of them said this. I think it was junior. But basically, one of the Trumps uh, tweeted, Voter Barbie must be a Democrat because she's already wearing an I Voted sticker, and yet she's got another ballot in her hand. Oh, mm. And Mattel had to reply, Barbie is not, and never has been, affiliated with a political party. <laughs> had to issue an official statement saying she's not a Democrat. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I think she is, though, clearly. Uh, clearly. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, can I tell you one more dueling method that happened? Yeah. So basically, the, you know the thing about you turn back to back, and then you walk, and then you... There, there are various different methods in different countries. Walk 10 paces, turn round, shoot. Sorry, yes. So the back... That's French, basically. Um, and there is a much more fun variant, which has, has another French name. It's called Avolante. <laughs> you face each other. Can we do the fun <laughs> duel? <laughs> well... <laughs> There was, people really relished it, you know, the, the, to a certain kind of person really seemed to enjoy it. So there's a variant called Avalante where you face each other, right? And you start walking towards each other. Oh, you can, either I of see. you can oh. fire whenever you like, but if you miss, you have to stand still and wait for the other Whoa. guy to shoot. <laughs> right. I know, and that feels tense. I thought you were going to say that you're standing right in front of each other and then you walk backwards away from each other and yeah. then... You're just hoping someone's not kneeling down behind you. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, yeah. really. God, all it these used rules. to be in the Olympics, didn't it? Pistol dueling. Yeah. 1906. It was one of the categories. It wasn't a medal one, but you would, you would. <laughs> so it was, it was a thing that was done there. Because the winner would be dead. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, sorry. Yeah. Just <laughs> pick silver, him up. I'm gonna put a silver medal on him. <laughs> But that would be the, there was like an inter-calorie games, wasn't there, yeah. in 1906? It wasn't the main games. And they used wax bullets, and the idea was you would just see who got hit first uh, and cool. best. And you had a sort of glass plate that was over your face. and But it was done as a proper thing with spectators really around cool. and everything. Yeah, it was very exciting. Have we said before that I think NASA found the oldest known rock, the oldest known Earth rock was on the moon and then brought back to Earth. Yes. Yeah, and then it was called Big Bertha was the name of the rock. <laughs> Um, was it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, they named it after a, a, I think, a gun from the First World War. So they brought that back, and it was the first Earth meteorite ever found on another body, as in the first, like meteor out, if you like. You know, the first like <laughs> bit of Earth that had hit somewhere else. Wasn't the, the moon created when uh, an asteroid hit the Earth and there was a little splash? So they say. So they say, yeah. Mm. No one's. I'm not sure I buy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pixar, it didn't happen. There's actually a strong theory that it is hollow. So, uh, <laughs> is this the moon cave theory? This is, oh yeah, I haven't heard it called that before, but I, yeah, yeah, I suppose yeah, because supposedly when you hit it, it rings like a bell. So, is it, it artificial? Been... Is it real? What, Listen, you mean when don't... a meteorite hits it, not if you just go? And... <laughs> yeah, As in, no. When they did drilling on the moon, they they right. they specifically tried to find out because you can and do they found it you can do like a bell. well you can do seismic tests on the moon to see what the composure is on the inside. Right, and it was completely empty apparently. And so, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm joking, <laughs> Hannah. I'm joking. I promise. I'm Thank joking. you. Oh, dear. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Thank um, you. Have you ever been in a diamond mine in your adventures, Hannah? No, I haven't. I wonder what that's like. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> 
I see we've run out of facts and entered speculation territory. <laughs> God. Uh, Andy, you've mentioned Oscar the Hypno Dog before on the podcast. Yes. Can you remember what that was? Oscar the Hypno Dog was a Labrador who was a hypno who was hypnotically trained and went <laughs> and like went missing. And there were signs put up all over the country saying, "Do not l look at this dog." <laughs> that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basically, he's dangerous. <laughs> we have mentioned that, but what I'd never heard before was about Puffy the Hypno Cat. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Puffy the Hypno Cat was in the 1940s in America. There was a guy who owned a bar, and he said that Puffy was sitting on the end of a nightclub bar, and a couple of girls came up to him, and I didn't really pay attention what had happened, but suddenly a girl was simply out on her feet. She simply wasn't from drinking. I'm something of a hypnotist myself, and I realized she was in a hypnotic trance. And it turned out that this cat had been hypnotizing people <laughs> in this guy's bar. Uh, and he started then training the cat to stare at people really, really <laughs> fixedly to try and hypnotize them. Uh, and uh, Puffy became really, really famous. And in 1945, the American Feline Society called her the king of all cats um, because she was bringing in money for war bonds. So you would go into the bar and you would pay some money to be hypnotized by the cat. And then, you know, they get the money for the war. Uh, and by the end of her life, she was credited with hypnotizing over 300 people, always for benign purposes. Oh, just weird. I spent all my money on tinned tuna. <laughs> so weird. Just left it open around the place. Well, probably, probably nothing. Um, <laughs> and you, Hannah, you're such a skeptic, you probably don't even believe that story's true. <laughs> Actually, that one I'm really behind. <laughs> one of us on this panel might be slightly harder to hypnotise than the other three. Oh, OK, oh. can we guess who? Um, is it Dan because of his dubious questioning <laughs> techniques? It's not Dan because oh. of his dubious questioning techniques. Uh, <laughs> I feel is like it this Hannah is, is it, with her scepticism? It's not Hannah with her dubious scepticism thing. Is it wow. Andy it. with his lack of ability to talk to people at parties? It's not me with my oh. lack of ability to talk to people at parties. Is I'm, it James for being so fucking judgmental about the other three people on the panel? <laughs> It's James, but not for that reason. Not for that reason. It's because... So, James, you have aphantasia, right? Oh, right, OK. Oh. So, you, so, James can't... Well, you said what it is. I just can't picture things in my head. Can't picture things in your head. Yeah. And that might make it harder to hypnotise you. Is it's, that there was right? a Well, this is from the UK Hypnosis Convention, which sounds amazing. <laughs> Last year's events included recreational erotic hypnosis uh, and aphantasia. What is it and why should we even care? Slightly... <laughs> Slightly barbed um, <laughs> subject for a talk, but... I, I don't know how much time we got. I got very deep in the weeds on people who want to be heroes and do bad stuff. Ooh, OK. Yeah, yeah go yeah. for it. Have uh, you heard of the hero complex? No. 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 So it's not quite a psychological disorder. It's not in the diagnostic manuals, but it's, like, talked about by psychologists. It's a thing where it's sometimes known as a vanity crime, where people are desperate to be the hero, so they'll do something bad so they can then rescue people. Yeah, oh, like yeah, I'd yeah. mug you but then beat myself up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly that. And hang yourself in, I guess, yeah. is the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'd rough myself up a bit first. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so well, I get my one bit of a lifetime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, like, there's, there's quite a lot of case studies. The really famous one's 1984, an LAPD police officer called Jimmy Wade Pearson heroically discovered and diffused a pipe bomb on an airport bus carrying the Turkish Olympic team in L.A., and people saw no. him running down like the airport, holding a pipe bomb, dismantling it and throwing it over his shoulder and shouting, get out, you know, like proper wow. like Bruce Willis stuff. And it turned out he had planted it there because no. oh, he mate. wanted to be the hero because uh, he wanted to transfer into a different department and his boss hated him. And he thought the only way I'm getting out <laughs> is if I get a uh, commendation. God. Wow. Uh, and he failed the polygraph and he ended up with 1500 hours of community service and it became a bit of a thing. But no. everyone was like, all right, well, no one was hurt. Fair enough. But then there's some really bad ones. So there's, there's a thing called firefighter arson, which is a serious okay. problem. Oh, yeah. Heard Have you of heard that. of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are 100 firefighters every year arrested for arson in America alone. There's a million firefighters, so it's a tiny statistic. But 100 people, most of them are young men, aged 16 to 30. I read a whole report issued in 2003 by the US government's National Fire Administration. I got very deep. Uh, <laughs> there are six primary motives. Excitement, vandalism, revenge, 
profit, political terrorism, hiding evidence of a crime. And it's a really big problem yeah. for a small subset. And there's a guy who's a Tennessee fire chief. He set fire to his own fire station. Oh. <laughs> wow. He caused three quarters of a million dollars of damage. And when released, he then set fire to a car dealership. <laughs> Oh and God. he did it for the sexual thrill. This is why we need Pornhub. Yeah. Right. Sexual? sexual? For the sexual thrill. thrill. He, he got off on the, on the thing. The worst one's John Orr, who was from Glendale Fire Service in California in 1991, was found to have planned eight arson attacks on shops and was suspected of many more. He killed four people in these fires. It was really, really horrible. Right. His main job at the Glendale Service, chief arson investigator. Wow. What a cover wow. story. And so they tailed him for months. And every time there was a fire investigating conference, there would be fires in the local area. <laughs> and he was possibly alleged to have set 2,000 fires, making him the most prolific American arsonist uh, on record. But one of the clues that they detected about him is that he had written a novel about a fireman who sets fires. <laughs> <laughs> ah, <laughs> it's like a serious thing. And I'm so sorry to get stuck on this, but I then watched Fireman Sam with my four-year-old daughter. Oh, yeah. And he I went, does he do that? Hang on a second. For sexual thrills? No. <laughs> I work for CBeebies. I don't want to get cancelled. Um, <laughs> no, but like, I realised Fireman Sam, he, he's in charge of a tiny, tiny village called Ponty Pandy, but yeah. he's got a fire truck, a rescue tender, a four-wheel drive SUV with inbuilt animal rescuing crane, a quad bike, an amphibious vehicle, a hovercraft, two helicopters and a mobile command centre. Wow. <laughs> this guy is playing the game. Like, he's clearly setting <laughs> fires that get, like, a huge budget. Um, can I just say one thing about George Bernard Shaw yeah. very quickly? Yeah, go he, for it. He had... Uh, you're, I'm saying it wrong, am I? No. But Bernard, Bernard is also Bernard, a It's like, Georg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Georg. Georg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just I've never heard it said, but like George Ber Bernard. Yeah. George. Oh, George Bernard Shaw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, George. I'm cool, whatever. Hey, wait, <laughs> it's all cool here. It's late night at the Soho. Yeah. We're not picking each other up on pronunciation. Are they going to go home going, God, there was this mad fucking fight about how to pronounce <laughs> Bernard. <laughs> oh, man, you've got to see Fish live. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, no, so um, he used to have a writing shed, which was amazing. He used yeah. to—he lived in Hertfordshire, and he had a writing shed, which was basically on a lazy Susan. He liked to chase the sun, so he would get in. The sun would be beaming right in, which was a big thing for him because he had specific glass, which is in the shed windows, that kind of beamed concentrated light in a way that it was meant to be healthy. It was thought to be a healthy. He was always thing. on fire, wasn't he? That's, <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> Burn hard. That's. <laughs> <how> <laughs> Tell you a bit about milk floats? Yeah, 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 yeah. For one thing, milk doesn't float. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, oh that's, yeah. Food if for left thought. On, if, if it's food for thought, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. If it's left on water, it will sink. Oh, so, right. um, oh, but, I, anyway, No, but if you mix it... It oh, stays. if you mix it, if you mix it, yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's not that wasn't the terms I was. Anyway, look, the point. <laughs> Milkfloats.org.uk has a, an FAQ page, and it's one of the, like it's a very it's a gorgeous website, milkfloats.org.uk. I cannot recommend it enough. And the FAQ page begins. All right, maybe they are not exactly frequently asked, but. <laughs> <laughs> but they might be the kind of questions people might ask given the opportunity. <laughs> So nice. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You want to do a quick game of is it bigger in Europe or America? Oh, yes. yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> what year? Ooh. 2023. Oh, wow. Okay. <gasps> so, where would you find the world's biggest dump truck? Dump truck? Um, uh, USA, America. That's, that's a mark of pride. I'm afraid not. It's in Belarus, in Europe. Really? Oh. Yeah, the Belaz 75710, which can move the equivalent of 1,000 whale testicles in one go. <laughs> that's, uh. that's my comparison. <laughs> that's yeah. not on the advertising. Uh. That's how you measure trucks. <laughs> I think we all know that. <laughs> the world's largest log jam. So that's when you have a load of logs in a river and they get stuck. And so where is it? Europe, in Europe or, America. or America? Oh, um, America. Well, I was tricked last time, so I'll, I'll say Europe this time. Well, you've been tricked again, Andy. <laughs> it's in none of us in Canada. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is that there, it's about 20 square miles of log jam, and it goes deep as well. And the logs store enough carbon to run 2.5 million cars for a year. Wow. That's interesting. Sorry, it? is that... Uh, 
It's a genuine question. Are there, is that logs that have been cut by humans? No, or is it's, it... they usually are like knocked down by wind and stuff okay. like that, and they fall into the river and they go down the river, and then there's like a little sort of point where they can't get out, and then they just jam and jam and jam and jam, and That's it's a really great. good way of hiding carbon. Nice. And then finally, the world's biggest barometer. Europe or America? Europe. I think I own... I think I have that in my home. <laughs> you? You've got yeah. a massive barometer, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> Don't boast. <laughs> <laughs> it's a famous barometer. Is it? Oh, yeah. God. Uh, it's one you see every day on TV. On TV? Every is day. Is there a barometer connected to Big Ben? <laughs> Somehow. That's good. Is if there like, is, I don't know about it. It's secretly also a Oh, wow. But it is in a... Europe. Oh, uh, right. It is in Europe. It is on Shepherd's Bush Roundabout. Uh, it's... <laughs> oh, yes, we all tune... Sorry, okay, we all tune in every morning for five minutes. <laughs> Just watch the live feed of Shepherd's Bush Roundabout. <laughs> and then we get on with our day, don't we? You know. Just check what the pressure's like. What? Where's... It's um, no, it's it's a huge barometer. It was built as a barometer. It no longer works as a barometer. Right. It's currently covering up a big pipe by um, London Water. But it, that building was what inspired the score column in the TV show Pointless. Oh, oh. inspired by the world's biggest barometer. Oh, God, these are easy. I'm surprised you haven't got any of these. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do barometers, do they, do they go up or down? I can't remember now. Depends which way you hold them. Yeah, okay, but they can yeah. go up, right? And what the weather's doing, yeah, yeah. It's just weird, because when you said Big Ben, I suddenly had this image of the, the, um, the mercury going up in a barometer, right? And it's yeah. suddenly, because I was at a fair the other week, and my son did that strongman thing where you hit it, oh, yeah. it has to hit yeah. the bell. Do you think there's anyone strong enough in the world that if that thing had to hit the bell of Big Ben, that they no. could hit it hard enough? No. So let's move on. Um, <laughs> One thing I do know about E.T. is that um, there's a lot of Reese's stuff in there, right? Oh, Reese's, Reese's Pieces. Reese's Pieces, yeah. which is like an American candy. Yep. Uh, but it was huge for them. So their sales went up like 65% the next week just after it had been in this movie. Wow. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is that they weren't the first choice. If you look at the original scripts, all of the bits where it says Reese's Pieces, it was originally going to be M&M's. But apparently, Mars turned it down because they didn't want to be associated with aliens. <laughs> They're called <laughs> Mars. Really? <laughs> I've got some stuff on uh, dropping things from parachutes. Um, oh, OK. This is uh, about a place called Franz Star Ranch and Brothel in Nevada. And I'm in. <laughs> they had an idea of a, an advertising campaign where they will put a mattress in the middle of an airfield, and if anyone could parachute and land on the mattress, then they would have a chance to spend the evening with any of the women okay, in right. the brothel. It didn't go very well. <laughs> the problem was that all the women would stand near to the, um, near to the place where people had to land, right. and the guy flying the airplane, not that high, could see everything that was happening and got completely distracted. There was also some side winds, and long story short, he crashed the plane. Oh, no. Everyone was fine. Oh. No one died. And the great, great moral of the story in the end is the crash plane was so good for business that they decided to leave it there, and it's still there in Nevada. If you ever see that crash plane <laughs> next to the brothel. Is the wow. brothel? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to Nevada. <laughs> Well, now I think you have. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Isn't that an amazing idea That's for good. advertising? Yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing idea. Sorry, <laughs> how, how low was the plane when he got distracted? It was quite low, but high enough that parachutes would work. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's quite high for a pilot to be like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like a little stick woman on the yeah, ground. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Check out the, I think, arms. <laughs> <laughs> on her, maybe arms? <laughs> no, it's a tree. That's a tree. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Do you know that John Major and Tina Turner were born on the same day? <laughs> were they? Yeah. Really? That's cool. Yeah. If, if my memory is... I didn't actually write wow, that down. Wow, that's off memory? Movie. That's off memory, yeah. Wow. I mean, once you hear that, you're going to forget that in a hurry. <laughs> I feel, you know everyone who was born on the same day as John Major. <laughs> Classic Andy. <laughs> in February 2020, yeah. 
there was a poll by the Center of Public Opinion. This is in the United States. It was ahead of the primary in New Hampshire, and they asked a load of voters uh, what they would rather, and they found that 64% of Democrats would rather see a giant meteor strike the Earth, extinguishing all human life, than see President Trump re-elected. <laughs> Do you know um, there's been a sequel to Phantom of the Opera, Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom of the Opera? Okay. Yeah, um, uh, yeah it, was, it was written by Ben Elton, and it was music by uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Okay. But it was delayed for months in the writing process because of Cats. The now, musical Cats? No. no. <laughs> his real-life cat. He had a kitten who stood on his digital piano and wiped out all the music that he had done <gasps> in the writing of it. Oh my God. Which just feels... God bless that kitten. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a group of secret operatives uh, from Britain called the Choir Boys, and they came up with a plan during World War II to drive Hitler mad by airdropping huge amounts of pornography into his compound. Oh, wow. Uh, in the end, they kind of slightly, you know, they came up with the idea, they started going for it, and they thought, you know, this is just stupid. And so they called off the whole, the whole idea, but not before, and I quote, the group had amassed an enormous collection <laughs> of suitable material. <laughs> oh, I, I made an invention once, cool. it, talking of cars and weeing. Um, wow, that is a hell of a Venn diagram there, I don't think. No, it's... I think it's, I can see where this is going. The, sure. it, I've forgotten the name, it's a really good name. But basically, you can piss and drive. <laughs> oh, OK, right. It was all in the name, which I can't remember. My what? great invention. <laughs> oh. Yeah. What's wrong with the piss and drive? <laughs> it's not as romantic. No, <laughs> I see, I see. So oh, it's wow. the idea that you just, you don't have to stop off at... Yeah, a... if you can't, um, like... I can't start my car a lot of the time, so it's annoying having to stop. It's brand new yeah. as well. It's an electrical fault, I think. Anyway, um, so I don't want to stop in case I can't start it again, so... Many people would get the electrical fault mended, but <laughs> no, I, I prefer no. what you've done. Engineer yeah. assistant where you never Where have can to... I piss? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does the urine get utilised? I'm thinking scream wash. Oh, yeah. Mm. That would work. Well, what? It's just water. It's yeah. mostly water. I'm yeah. wondering if it's you pissing all over your electrics and then stopping <laughs> the car from functioning to oh. begin with. I'm wondering that. <laughs> In Norway, if you are a fish um, factory and you're kind of getting all the fillets out, what you'll do is you get the rest of the fish and you'll throw it away into a little area with all the heads and stuff like that. In that area, children are allowed to go in and they cut out the little tongues of the cods. No. And they sell them for extra no, pocket money. No, no, no. Oh. And this is a really common thing in a place called Lofferton. Um, and from about six years until 17, you'll get loads of kids who will just go in, grab the fish, and they'll cut out this little tongue in the back, and apparently mm. it's the tastiest part. And do you think they turn out to be psychopaths, like serial killers and psychopaths? Yeah, unfortunately, in that area, there is a lot of death. No, there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to know some other things that people are scared of? Singers? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I wrote some down, so I thought I'd do some work after you told me I was getting paid. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot to tell you that until, yeah, quite late in the day. Um, but, but thank you for bringing your one sheet of... Uh... <laughs> It wasn't very much I'm getting paid, so it, this is a fitting. Um, wait till you hear them. <laughs> Adele is scared of seagulls. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, there's more. <laughs> Rihanna's scared of fish. OK. And Kylie Minogue is scared of coat hangers. She's scared of coat hangers. Coat hangers, hangers. yeah, really? Kylie Minogue. And I'm scared of commitment. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all different, aren't we? How many different well, types of wrestling do you think there are in Iceland? One type of wrestling. Unlucky, there are two types of wrestling. <sighs> uh, but they do have the same name, so I can see why you got that. That's what I was thinking um, of, yeah. It's called Glima. And basically, there's two types, and they're quite similar, but one of them is a type of wrestling that you would do as a Viking if you came home after a long day doing whatever Vikings do and you wanted to warm yourself up. They would just do some wrestling. Nice. Who uh, with? With another Viking. Right. <laughs> that sounds like a good it's idea. It's wholesome, right, yeah? yeah. Uh, there was another one which was the dueling version, uh, and it was quite similar, but it would take place in a field with a large flat stone known as the slaying slab. 
Uh, and that one, you would try and slam your opponent onto the slab and break the back. <laughs> wow. And the amazing thing That's about terrifying. this is they were going to have it in the 1912 Stockholm Olympics. <laughs> okay. I think probably the first version, not yeah. the second one. And then the war happened, and so the Olympics got postponed. Right. Uh, and in 1920, they were going to do it anyway. You know, they've decided, okay, we'll keep all the same sports. But Iceland decided that it only had a certain number of wrestlers and it needed them to impress the King of Denmark, who was visiting at the same time as the Olympic Games. And so they decided we're not going to do this wrestling after all. We just want to impress the King of Denmark. So it never became a worldwide sport that it might have done otherwise. Right. Oh, sure. uh, and then in the end, the King never came. No. Oh, no. That's gutting. There was um, a shanty, not a shanty, but a sea song when you were getting your grog. So you would get your, the amount of alcohol you were allowed each day. Yeah. They would give it you and they would sing while they were doing it. And it was a song called Nancy Dawson. And it's the tune that we now know as Here We Go Round the Mulberry Bush. Um, but it was all about Nancy Dawson, who was a stage sort of performer, an actress, possibly a prostitute, and the... I'm not going to say what the words are to the Navy song about her, but uh, they are... Are they, are they rude? They are very rude. I think There's... we say sex worker now, dear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 um, they were meant to be quite easy, weren't they? Because you couldn't, like, not... Well, sex workers. Could... No, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> Depends how good you are at it. <laughs> oh, no, I meant the songs to sing. Because, um, like, some people can't sing. Names of registered competitive roller derby players include Skate Bush, Venus Thigh Trap, <laughs> and Weird Al Spankabitch. <laughs> I sort of thought, what's, like, the rudest name that you can get to? So I looked up the C-U-N-T word, and I was heading down that way, but on the way, I discovered the C-L-I-T word, and do you again, know, do you know how to say that? <laughs> go on, go on, Dan, give us one. Clite. Um, okay, well, in the CLIT, uh, you've got uh, Clitastrophe. Oh, yeah. Please welcome to the ring Clitosaurus Rex. Oh, that's so good. Very good. Clitler is about to enter the ring. <laughs> oh. And who's this coming up the ring? Clitty, Clitty, Bang, Bang. <laughs> Oh. 